So we kind of talked about like the this space, the conversations mm. that we're part of, and yeah. kind of who knows where you sort of draw the boundaries. But there is sort of definitely a coherence to the conversation. And I want to kind of ask where you feel that coherence is at the moment, because for me, I was really struck by recently. I did a hosted a conversation between Paul Kings North and Mary Harrington that felt to me to be sort of a very interesting coalescing mm. of the conversation that overlaps with a lot of the conversations that you've had. Paul Vanderclay has been talking about. And they were really talking about, if I could summarize their conversation, it was sort of looking at, I call, I call it the war on reality. Mm. And was this sort of sense that there is a, a war on all limitation. Mm. Mary called it a sort of, uh, what do you call it, luxury, ne- luxury Gnosticism. Fully automated luxury Gnosticism. Fully automated luxury Gnosticism. And Paul talks about the machine, the sort of obliteration of any sense of place, turning everything into kind of like, I think Mary called it a standing reserve, but I think Paul would call it kind of quantification and interchangeability and that this, and Paul also kind of located that in a kind of almost like a metaphysical space rather than a kind of a, a, a defined plan by like a group of people, which is where it starts becoming sort of overlaps with the conspiratorial ecosystem. But that for me felt like a very live, fascinating exploration. It felt like a kind of moving together of lots of different parts of the conversation. And I know you've both kind of listened to it and it overlaps a lot with some of the things that you've been thinking about. What, what did you make of that? And where do you feel, do you think that is sort of partly where, one of the frontiers of the conversation? Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, the thing I just said was actually like motivated by this because the fetishization of freedom, right? And making it into this kind of absolute, no limits, no limits. Um, I, I, that's one of the things that both Mary and Paul are putting their fingers on. And then the other, and Jonathan and I have had two discussions around this, the, 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 the discovery of the collective intelligence of distributed cognition and how it has a life of its own, and that we don't have a good way of talking about this or thinking about this. These are the two themes. I have a lot of criticisms about what both of them said in specifics, but uh, what, what, like, like let's, let's go to the Gnosticism. Right. Um, the, 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 yeah, this, 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 um, like almost like a corrosive acid. We're we're gonna we're gonna carry out. We're gonna we're gonna fulfill the project of the enlightenment through absolute liberation. And what that means is that all limitations are physical limitations in our body. Right. We're, we're gonna. You know, maybe Kurtz file, we're going to do the transhumanism thing, the rapture of the nerds, or right, we're going to do, right, we're, we're, I'm going to do, I'm just going to modify my body, or I can, I'll, 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 I'll merge with my avatar. And the, like, there's all these pseudo transcendence that's everywhere, right? And it's again, as far as I can see, the only thing that justifies this. It is, are you getting closer to reality? No. Are, 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 are you somehow making things beautiful? No. You know, is there some way, you know, can you show me how this is um, uh, ethical? You might get a bit of an answer, but it's ultimately justified in terms of, well, it's about freedom and the absolutization of it. And it's like, why do you, what, like, you don't understand limits. You, so this, now, let's move into my domain, cognitive science, constraints. The problem with words is words can be marked or unmarked, uh, just quickly. So if I say to you, how tall is someone, that doesn't mean anything. But if I say, how short are they, that means they're short. The problem with the word constraint is it's a marked term, but you have to hear it unmarked. You have to hear it the same way you hear tall, OK? Because constraints are both selective and enabling. Evolution. Evolution need, needs natural selection, and it kills things off, and it winnows things down, yes. Right? But it also has variation. These are enabling constraints. Limits not only, right, and this is what I mean about don't hearing, you have to hear the term un, in an unmarked way. They're not just constraining you, they're also affording you. Right? So li- language limits me. I'm a critique, I, I criticize this. Here. Propositions limit us, but language also enables me. I can talk about you know, what, it, what, what might have happened if Africa had discovered steam power earlier than England. I can do that. And you can go, oh. And you can, can like language, uh, Bertrand Russell once said, no matter how eloquently a dog barks, it can't tell you that its parents were poor but hardworking. So language both limits me in the negative sense, but it also affords me in the positive sense. And, 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 and so absolute, 
absolute freedom and an absolute removal of all, well, I'll become completely self-determining. But do you, does that mean you think the self is a bound, limited thing? No, the self is completely, and it's like, what do you mean by self-determination if there's no limiting, if there's no you know, coherent notion of what a self is? It just becomes this, it's what my hands are doing. And, 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 and it's like, why? You need to give me an overwhelmingly convincing argument why I should care about that at all. And so for me, them, they're putting their finger on the fact that, right, we're, we, we have, for me, I mean, at one point we should talk about what was good about Gnosticism. I, you know, the Gnosticism is trying to address when people feel sort of existentially trapped, existentially ignorant, inertia, Right? There, there's a reason why we have Gnosis. There's a reason why that term was in the ancient literature. But putting that aside, right, there's an important thing there, right? This idea of freedom, like even in, like you should always ask freedom from and freedom to. Yes, okay, I want to be, I want to be free from the limits of my body. Free to, free to do what? And, and tell me something that you love to do that doesn't involve your body. I, 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 don't, I don't know what that means. Right? Well, uh, and so, what are you being free to do? And for me, the free to is actually what I was mean, 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 I'm free to actually lose my freedom in love. I'm, I, like, I, I, I want to love the truth. Frankfurt calls it a voluntary necessity. I want to love the truth. I want to love what's good. I want to love what's beautiful. And, and, and finally, just, just, just on this, I want to get free from, like, the, like, your body, this is part of the guts of relevance realization. Your body is not Cartesian clay, right? Your body is an autopoetic, it's a self-making system, and it, it, because it is making itself, it is constantly taking care of itself, and therefore it's constantly caring about itself, and that's why you can care about this information rather than that information, rather than a computer. Relevance realization is dependent on the fact that you're embodied. Your bioeconomy, the cost functions, is what actually prevents you from trying to look at everything and think of everything. You take that limitation away and you hit combinatorial explosion. Because here's the thing, you think you're going to open up your limits and reality is just going to be there, stable for you. You open up those limits and reality will say, watch what I can do. <laughs> And that's what it's doing. Exactly. <laughs> Don't you think that possibly, I think one of the frames that I try to see it through is the, the frame of, of desire. It seems to be, there's something that happened. It, it's related to consumer culture, it's related to the 60s, it's related yeah. to a strange inversion from virtue into desire. Mm -hmm. So Virtue into value. Sorry. So we replaced talking about what people's virtues are with, with what they value. Right. Yes, in that sense, yes, yes. in that sense of what they what they think has value to them, let's yes, say, at least yes. personally, and and then so I think that that there's something related to that, and then what happens, and we know it from every tra tradition in the entire world, is that if you turn your eye, so it's like there's nothing wrong with desire, no. but it's like if you turn your eye towards desire, then it explodes. It's like it's an it's, it's indefinite, insatiable. it's insatiable, exactly, yes, yes. and if you enter into that space and you enter into it in terms of consumer culture or in terms of all the, even in terms of like the hippie, you know, like the free love or whatever, like we just can do, we can have as much pleasure as we want. It's insatiable, there's no limit to it. Yes, and yes. so, it, and then it moves towards idiosyncratic desires, right? So you can see that in the sexual fetish, fetishizations where it's like all these little sexual desires start to like appear, all these weird little pornographic sexual desires start to manifest themselves, like actually appear in the world and you kind of, they kind of multiply and multiply and multiply. Yes. And so there's no limit. And so it's, a, it's about desire and power. And so what the machine has always been, the machine from the beginning is always about increasing power. That's what all civilizations do, right? So the civilization apparatus itself is about increasing power. Now, if we do it in, with your eye towards desire, then it will lead to, it leads to something like the metaverse because your desires are idiosyncratic. You cannot be a horse 
But if you live in the metaverse, you can be a horse today or for five minutes if you want, and then you can switch to doing something else. And you can, so you can just like cycle the craziest desires, like one after the other, and live in this whirlwind of, of, of desire and like, uh, of like impermanent identities that just keep flipping from one to the other and thinking that that's what will satisfy you and it will never satisfy you. So I think that there's something about that this, this kind of Gnosticism which has to do with that. It's actually, it's actually like the, it's the, it's, let's say, it's even the end of the very idea of technology itself. Technology as the notion of increasing of power to do things. Mm -hmm. But they, it's, they're not, it's not bad in itself. It can be turned towards a good. Yep. But technology always has a danger because it is an increase of power. That if it's not balanced with wisdom, then it will, it will turn towards. And what we've seen in the, in the modern age is exactly that, that move where we've, we've discarded wisdom slowly. We've seen the great power that this tech, technological understanding affords us. And we just are throwing ourselves into it. And so there's a, the, the correlation between the obsessions and desires and, and slavery to desires and this increasing technocratic, technological world that, that makes you think that you'll be able to escape all limitations to your desires is completely coherent. Like it, it's, it seems that it's, it makes sense that it's happening this way. Okay, and, the, and so the change, it cannot be a technical, technological change. No, no, I, the I, change has I, to be a change of worldview, basically. Yes, yes. And so, first of all, that, that's excellent. Um, and, you know, um, so I think there's a deep connection uh, between the, the notions of freedom and the notions of power, and that both of them are being uh, transformed into absolute goods rather than instrumental goods. Mm. I didn't say freedom wasn't good. No. I didn't say power wasn't good. I said they're instrumental goods, they're not inherent goods. Right? Whereas virtue is about trying to be in right relationship with that that is inherently good. Right? Inherently real, inherently etc. Right? So I agree that it's, it's that. Um, I suppose what I would want to say is what you just said at the end. Um, the part about the talk about the machine in the cathedral is um, I want to I want to I want to slow down that mm -hmm. because you invoked a different term that I think is more appropriate, um, which is worldview, um, and I think worldviews are absolutely necessary for um, relevance realization, and I think they have to continually evolve. Also, what, now what I'm so the thing about we all face the paradox of communication and cooperation. What I, this is from Montague. What I mean by that, okay. So if you and I don't communicate, we'll work at cross purposes, and that will actually undermine, will waste our lives to some degree, right? But if we just talk, we'll also waste our lives, right? And so, well, what do you do? Well, one of the things you can do is you can let's use an analogy. The brain does this, and the, so. Imagine a, a happily married couple, and they've been married for a long time, okay? And they almost have telepathy, mm. right? And so, it, now why is that? Because the husband, I'll, 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 just for ease, I'll, I'll, it's ease of conversation, I'll presume they're a heterodox, uh, sorry, not heterodox, hetero, heterosexual couple. Um, um, and, right, the husband has internalized a model of his wife and given it considerable space in his psyche. And so he can consult that model when he's not with her. And she can consult her model because she's internalized him. And they can both act in a coordinated fashion without having to spend that much time talking to each other. Right? Now the thing is, we can't, we, and this is what we do with friendships, and, but we can't do that with sort of, so what we do, and this is Mead's idea, is we create Think about a baseball team, right? This is Mead's example. What I do is I create, I internalize not you or you. I, I do that a little bit, but I'll internalize the generalized other. What, what anybody else on the team would do. That's called the generalized other. And then I can consult that model, and then I can play well with a whole bunch of people. And then you take that up a notch. What a worldview is, it's, it's, a, it's a generalized agent, what, it, what, what any agent is in our, in our group, and this is the arena for our group so that we can coordinate without you and I and all having to talk directly to each other in depth. That's irreplaceable. You can't, you can't 
I'm going to dispense with worldviews. Do, do you understand? Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. And, and, and you have to. So, but notice if the couple never talk, it's a disaster. And if they talk too much, that means something's probably going wrong. They have to cycle between it, right? And so the worldview has to cycle between you. You accept it, and then you might revise it. And then you. It has to evolve. I put to you that one of the functions, not the only, one of the, and this is derived from Goethe's idea, one of the function of religion was exactly that, to, 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 to create, participate, and, and, and curate a worldview for people. Yeah, I agree. Right. So part of my worry about the, the, the criticism of the machine and, right, and, and the cathedral is, yeah, that's right, we do have these hyper objects and they do exercise a kind of hyper agency, but we need them, yeah. right? We can't do without world views. We can't do without. So again, I, I, I was worried about there being a crypto Gnosticism under the critique of Gnosticism, which is let's get free of world views. And it's like, no, that's not, you can't do that because you won't be able to run a, you know, a civilization. Yeah, but I think it, knowing Paul and, and having talked to him several times and listening to the conversation, I, I was, I think that what he's saying is that there's something about... You know him better than I yeah, do, so I'll the, admit he, that. Yeah. He, he says there's something about, let's say what you could call something like the, the traditional worldviews, yeah. which have this, this organic embedded structure of, 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 of relationships and hierarchies that, that are you know, they develop forever and they're just kind of, they're, that's what they are, that's how they work. And that, and that this has, it has ritualization, there's things we celebrate, you know, all of these things are, are part of it. Um, and that this has been replaced or there's been a, a move to replace it by what, what he calls machine. the machine. And this, and this machine is, a, is like a parody Right of these more organic integrated systems, and and it, it has to have some aspect of of it, or else they couldn't exist, right? Exactly. So exactly, so so exactly. It, it's taking some aspects of how identity functions, and it's radicalizing in some ways, and you can see it because one of the things that they talk about is freedom. It's hilarious because I totally agree with them, but we also have to remember that that the, the freedom that they talk about. This like this reduction, this reducing of all constraints on reality has to exist in exact balance with the most control that you've ever experienced in your entire life. More control than any, any society has ever been able yeah. to, to, to impose on anyone. Yeah. And so those two things strangely coexist together. You can see it's a radicalization of a normal relationship, let's say, of something like freedom and authority, which right. would, would just kind of organically uh, manifest itself in a normal, not sometimes in a messy way and sometimes in a violent way, but would, would, would work itself out. Whereas now what we've got is, in order to go, in order to access the metaverse and to have access to absolute freedom to do whatever you want, you have to give up every single aspect of yourself to this machine. You have to be completely submitted to it. You have to see, you know, everything about you is going to be owned by this thing and there's no way out of it. And so it's like, it's, a, it's, it's 1984 and, and Brave New World at the same time. Like, who thought that this was possible? But it seems like that's what we're kind of seeing on the horizon, where it's like, it's absolute control, and, but one that is balanced out weirdly with this. Okay, this is excellent. This is tremendously helpful. And thank you for, um, for, uh, for speaking on his behalf, because he's not here yeah. to speak for himself. So, there's now an issue, uh, an issue of almost finesse or virtuosity or nuance, because you can't you can't be critical of the self-organizing have of a, having a life of its own aspect of this thing right. because that's how it functions, right? So that can't well, be. What yeah, you, I right? think the, the reason why they're doing the, to have that aspect of the conversation is because one of the problems that we're seeing in this in this type of discussion is that when you point out to the machine. People will say that's not possible because it requires a conspiracy, Again, a complete yeah, centralized conspiracy, yeah. and therefore what you're saying is false. And what Paul's trying to say, no, th what I'm saying doesn't require that. Yes. I can sh these yes. self these self organizing systems exist. This is one of them. It's it's excessive. It's it's parasitic. 
And so, and I can describe it and say that it exists without, and you can't accuse me of saying it can't exist because it would require this insane, like absolute top-down hierarchy to, 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 to be co co communicating all I think all that way. argument is very well placed, yeah. and thank you for bringing it up. Like the, 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 one of the things, and you and I have talked about this, right? right? One, of, one, of the, one of the damages of conspirituality is, is its inability to see hyper objects and see hyper objects as self-organizing entities that can, can have a collective intelligence and kind of a collective agency. And that's one of the big, that's one of the, 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 the really worrying uh, kinds of blindness that that can do. And so I think that argument is well placed. What, but what, let me try, what, what, what I'm trying to say is, like, the, 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 like this is, well it's running on its own, and you're right, that needs, people need, but that, that's not, it's, that's not what's wrong with it. No. Right, not, right, no, right, right. And so what I think is not being said that, they're tr that needs to be said is that they're trying, I'm gonna say this very carefully, and you, you know Paul better than I do, you both know their work better than I do, so I may be speaking out of ignorance, so I'll just caveat that. But I think they're trying to find a metaphysical location for evil. Mm -hmm. They're trying to get, so what happens in the Enlightenment is we, we lose sin and we lose evil and we replace it with immorality. Mm -hmm. right. Now, there was, there was great advantages to that. There's, there's a lot gained, but again, there was something lost, which is we actually don't, right, we, like, we, we, we can't understand evil because we've reduced it to morality and we've reduced morality to individual choice because we, you know, that we've, Kantian ethics, yeah. autonomy of it, right? So, what I'm trying to, say, they're, they're trying to say something like, they want, I think what they would like to say is, you know, the machine is evil. Yeah, but I, but I think that they, they, I think, so when I listen to them, and I don't know if they would say this, but what I get from them, and this is maybe filtered through my own yeah. symbolic lens or whatever, is to say something like, what I see is the desire to instrumentalize all things towards desire. They won't say desire, they say freedom. But yes. like, I yeah, yeah. prefer the desire part because I think it's closer to a whole historical development. Well, freedom is understood as freedom from restraint on desire. Exactly, there you go. Okay. And so, so what they're saying is that you're trying to instrumentalize things in the name of this. And I think that that's, e that's evil. That's a good definition of evil. Okay. Evil is instrument instrumentalization of things towards my own self, okay. self this, desire. Okay, but this is the part that's missing from their work, right. the conversation we're having right now, which is this needs to be a discussion about, but it's not, there's no, there's no reason to sort of, ah, because it's self-organizing or because it's distributed cognition or because it's a hyper object or because it takes on a life of its own. It's what they basically want to say is that's evil. Yeah. And, and it's evil that's, that's not the same as the immorality of individual choice and behavior. It's got a life of its own. Yeah. That, the ancient notion of evil was that it was something beyond immoral behavior. Yeah. It, had, it had a non-existence, you know what I yeah, mean when yeah, I'm yeah, doing yeah. it. Has a, it has a reality independent of human being. This is Augustine's great, he claims his great discovery, mm -hmm. right? That there's something pulling him down that's not his choice. Yeah but it somehow infects his choice and makes him believe it's his choice, right? And, and then he tries with original sin and we won't get into the, the theology. But the, 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 the insight there is that we wanna say, no, no, there's something beyond, there's something else that goes on yeah. beyond immoral, like you, you, you can see, you can see Arendt wrestling this with, the, with like when she's Eichmann and the banality of evil. Yeah. Like, like, why is this guy so banal? Yeah. He's making these banal individuals, they're immoral, but they're banal. Yeah. How do we get the titanic evil yeah. of the Nazis from a bunch of people acting immorally? Like, like she's really, that, that's how I, I'm reading her. She's re do you see what I'm trying no, to say? No, I about? totally agree, I, but I think that there's a, I think that the, the narrative, if you look at, the, the people can't, I understand, people don't understand the narrative and they've been ruined by science fiction and, and movies where they see like demons with wings that are with swords and fighting. And so, but that's the whole demonology, that's what demonology is. Right, demonology is to understand that evil is transpersonal. It, it, has, it has a kind of parasitic intelligence yes. and that you can recognize it, you can name it, and you can see the pattern, and you can notice when it embodies itself. And then you can see that for most of us, sometimes, most of us will, will let's say, give up to some demon sometimes. Like I get angry, I do this, I do that. But then sometimes some people get completely taken over by 
something, a, a parasitic uh, uh, pattern that they, that they become completely uh, taken over by, and then they're possessed. They're, they're possessed by the demon of anger, and that this is something that, that happens. I think that that's what demonology is. And if, I mean, I understand people would be hesitant to bring back demonology because it has so many weird uh, connotations, but if we can understand it properly, we can see that it is this idea that th there are these patterns that are intelligent and that are a have a gen agency, and that you can recognize them, and that, like you said, it's not, it doesn't, necessi doesn't ne necessitate conscious actors yeah. all through no. the way that they embody themselves. It doesn't at all. Yes. But you can still see the structure and you can still see it embodying itself. So, so yeah, I mean, we've had another discussion about this. You know, we've had two. And I, I, the idea of, uh, you know, distributed cognition, uh, collective intelligence, and that I, I think the evidence for this is overwhelming and, you know, uh, Dan Chappie and I published papers on that, and you know, uh, uh, shared agency, and uh, and and I. Th so I think, I think we're we're. What I'm saying is we're because we're breaking out of the individualistic model of cognition. We are now cr maybe groping, or at least moving towards an ontology in which we can now relocate what we used to point at with demons and evil and not just try and place it within individual moral choice. That's what I'm suggesting is actually the key thing that is happening here. And I don't see them actually recognizing it. I think it's implicit in what they're doing, yeah. but I think this is actually the key thing that's happening. But I think, I, maybe if, I think they're fixing yeah. it on the wrong but thing. But I, I, it's funny, because like, I think that someone, maybe I'm speaking for Paul, but I think that there's a fear. People are afraid to talk about these things. Because, like, look what I just said. I just said, I'll say, I'll, say, I'll say it straight out. I said, there's a demon that is a watcher, that is a, there's a, that's watching over a pattern of reality, and that is what is maintaining it together and making its boots work in the world. And the, the, these people are possessed and are unwilling agents of a demon, and they're bringing about this system. And it's like, okay, really? And then everybody looks, starts to look around and tries to get out of the room. Right, but the, but the point, and, and you know, we, we don't completely agree on this, although we, we like, uh, like uh, whether or not, the, the, whether well, not. Maybe I could just say one thing. So yeah. I think that our long conversation, for yeah. hours and hours of conversation, had made it possible for me to say that. Yeah. And I think you were able to see that I, that what I mean has is coherent. I'm using a language. I'm trying to yes, bring back yes. a traditional language to explain something which I can then I could break it down in causalities. I could use other languages if you want, but that that language is is also possible. And I think that what I think that Paul, if I had Paul in a in a private conversation and I would say, do you think there's a demon behind this? He might say yes, but he's like, I don't know how to say that. Well, he, he did say that the, the he felt that the the driver was metaphysical. Right. So they pointing. he's kind of pointing towards something like that. Okay. That's an interesting question, but yeah. you're, you're, you're a professor with tenure, like, you don't talk about kind of metaphysics in this, in this way. Do, do you feel, do you feel uncomfortable about... What do you mean? So be, me, me, well, I, I do talk about... Distributed you've, you've, got a reputation to person, you've got a reputation to protect, we don't, <laughs> is basically what I'm saying. <laughs> um, like, and, and Jonathan's pointing at this, that there is a discomfort with this language, a discomfort with this, but you're kind of... You're pointing in that direction with the talk of kind of distributed co cognition. Absolutely. There's other people like B.J. Campbell now talking about egregores, and it's sort of like overlapping with with talk of the occult, with with sort of areas that are not comfortably within academia, for example. I mean, uh, I, I mean, I published three papers on it, so at least mm -hmm. some part of it's comfortable in academia and in, 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 in important journals. Um, so I, I think. This idea of extended cognition, extended mind, distributed uh, cognition, collective intelligence, hyper objects, hyper agents. Um, I think this is all, um, I, like I said, I think it's giving a metaphysics that is free from some of the his, history that, Jason, uh, that uh, Jonathan acknowledged, but he, he was also, he's trying to put it aside. Like he's trying, like, he, he's, like you said, there's all these images, there's all this history, there's all these horror movies, there's all this other stuff that I... But I, I don't see it as a way to, right now, I don't see it as a way to cast it aside. What I I'm not see it aside. as a way to recapture it in a manner that will not be silly and, and superstitious and, and ridiculous. That it will actually, that I think that this moment and your work 
affords the possibility I, I, of going back into a medieval grimoire, right, and saying, okay, we can now understand this in a better way that the horror movie doesn't understand. I, I, I and that, so give me that caveat, right, okay. and then my answer to you is, given that caveat, I'm happy to talk this way. But I, in addition to demons, I would talk about daemons, right? And I would talk about demoniums. These are all, there's a multiplicity of terms in Greek. And, we, and we've only picked up the one term. So Socrates has his demonium, his divine sign, yeah. right? Right. And there's the... And, but there's all, I, I've been thinking about this so much and I've been trying to poke at it. There seems to be the, the positive aspect and the negative aspect of these principalities. And interestingly enough, like St. Gregory talks about the angel of the right hand and the angels of the left hand of God. Mm -hmm. And he says that the angel of the left hands are basically the demons and they're unwittingly doing the, the transcendent work without them knowing what they're doing. But yeah, so there isn't a neutral category. And I'm like, there's gotta be a neutral category. <laughs> But in Islam, they have the notion of the jinn as yeah. an ambiguous category. Yes. And I think in Christianity, that's why, although officially in the, let's say in the theology, we only have these, this duality. In the folk religion, you'll always have the fairies and you'll always have uh -huh. these wood, wood sprites, all these manifestations of intelligent patterns, that natural intelligent patterns yeah. that, that people talk about that, that are kind of ambiguous because you know that you know, what happens in the woods is... It's ambiguous, right? It's yeah. not always, it's not good or bad. It's like, you know, it's, yes. it, it can be, it, but it does, it still has that wonder. So I've been trying to find spaces for that, but I, I'm not totally sure I found a way to talk about it yet mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is coherent with, to, to have like a, yeah, this idea of these, of like the way that the daemon would have functioned in Greek culture yes. would have not necessarily been good or bad. It would just have been like something that you, that, that, Eros is considered a daemon yeah. uh, in, in, in the symposium, right? And, and, and then so Socrates' demonium is something that's also just uh, one step aside, because it's not a daemon, but it's a demonium. It, it's, it's something like a daemon in him. Um, so it, it's, a, it's, a much more, it's a much more complicated and interesting taxonomy. Yeah. Um, but you have the notion of the guardian angel, like in, in some Russian theology, for example, there's a notion that the guardian angel is the best aspect of you. Right. It's like the aspect that you projected into heaven, you could mm -hmm. say, and that's mm -hmm. what your guardian angel is. And that's what's kind of, if you read, when you ever, when you come to St. Gregory of Nyssa and you read the, the life of Moses, you'll see he talks about, he talks about the angel on the right shoulder and the demon on the left shoulder. Yeah. And he puts those both into Aaron. And he says, Aaron is both of those at the same mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. you, you'll find it very interesting when you get there. Anyways, sorry, this is way off now. <laughs> no, no, this is still on topic. Um, there's one last thing I wanted to, to bring up, and I'll talk about Paul van der Klee, who, which, which ties a few of these things together and also pushes into something of personal interest, which is uh, the future of real wisdom and kind of this sense that, well, wrapping up the project and moving on to other things. So Paul mentioned how this area of the internet is kind of dealing with the questions, what is the nature of the civilizational crises we're facing and what are the paths out? Um, and he said part of the difficulty and the opportunity of the moment is that this little corner of the internet is what holds the heterodox community together is resistance against the hegemonic thesis institutions. But he says, this makes the heterodox space to some degree always reactive and that reactivity is antithetical to the sorts of institution building that's necessary for sustained human reformation and flourishing. And this overlaps, you, you tweeted out, I think in 2020, saying that the idea of like heterodox, rebel, dark, was not a sort of sustainable platform for building new institutions or for, for whatever needs to come next, yeah. which is something intuitively that I've been finding and feeling with the narrative journey of rebel wisdom. Like it feels like it was the right thing to, to cover that insurgency. It was a real, it was a necessary moment, sort of from 2016 onwards, and covering that whole narrative was, was the right thing to do. But for me, it feels like that story has been told and that actually what's needed now is synthesis. What's needed now is actually a process of integration and not just a sort of rebellion or, or a heterodoxy. So, yeah, I'd, I'd love to I hear mean, your I, thoughts I, on I, that. I agree. I even, you might have not seen that tweet, but I said very early, I think, like right, maybe a few months after it started, I said, I do not identify with the intellectual dark web. Like, I just do not identify with that name. I don't want, there's something, there's something that to me doesn't, that's not what I want. Like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be the, just a guy poking at the system because then you lose, you've already lost. Um, and I, but I think that there, there is, like, you're right, and where you are and what you want to do next, 
I think it's possible right now because there was a need for some deconstruction. There was always a need to kind of break down the assumptions and then once the assumptions are break down, you can't just keep doing that. You have to then plant a new seed. You have to rebuild it. In the parable of the sower, Christ talks about right, the, the seed grows in the, the plowed earth. You have to do it. Plowed earth means it's not already a path. It's not already anything else. You have to kind of break down some things. And then after that, we can kind of build out of it. And so I think, damn it, I wish the bad. I hope that, that, that it's something you're able to find your, your line or your path to, to create something positive. Mm. Well, we're all doing it in our own way. It's yeah. not just, yeah. it's not, it's not going to be a... Uh, um, I, I guess the issue, um, like, like uh, on my tombstone, neither nostalgia nor utopia, um, is, um, right, um, I agree. We, 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 you know, Paul and I had a recent video where we were talking about what this, what's, what we're facing right now, the choices we're facing, uh, he and I. Um, and... And, and, and the, I mean, I, uh, L.A. Paul's work comes to mind here. Like, if you could see what's going to happen in the transformation, you're not going through a real transformation. If you can infer your way through it, then you're not. You're just, you're just extrapolating, right? And so that's why I'm really resistant to utopias, because it's a claim that, that you can see where, right? And then that, that undermines what I think is happening, which is a genuine transformation. So. The difficulty we're facing right now. Can't imagine there from here. It's basically. Right yeah, there. the imaginal link is is difficult. The imaginal link is it's is difficult, um, and 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 it's and it's needed. You can't do it without the imaginal link. You you can't go through transformation without doing imaginal serious play. That's the talk I gave at Cambridge. Like ritual is absolutely necessary, but the the the, the question then becomes: Well, what are right? We, we we sort of like we deconstructed. We broke the frame. But how do we how do we how do we properly I guess how do we properly ritualize the transformation? Um, because the the thing and this is where there might be some significant difference between Jonathan and I. Although he says very provocative things about the death and resurrection of Christianity itself. So um, um, like I don't I don't know I'm not it's not clear in my mind what how how we move forward. Mm. And start to build the civilization. I, <clears throat> one thing I, I think I've tried to take lessons from history. I've tried to take a lesson from the birth of Christianity, the notion of stealing the culture. You don't you don't come in with a political revolution. You don't come in with socioeconomic policies. What you do is you 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 build new homes, new ways of people being together and gathering together, and you build and then they network together and you you build you steal the culture, and and so I think that's what has to happen, and, but. I, I, it's, it, it comes down to very practical questions, like we're, we're trying to network a lot of these emerging communities of practice together, and we want to vet them, but we're like, who are we to do this, and where is this authority coming from, and what are the criteria by which we do the vetting? Right now, we've, be, we've just been relying on, I trust Jonathan, and I trust Paul, but like, if we want to make a civilization, we, we, that, that's got to scale in some fashion. So um, I totally agree with that it's the, 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 I think we're at the Kairos, we're at the point of the turning. Um, I, I'm suspicious of people who just say, well, here's the answer, nostalgia, or I see the future, utopia, very suspicious of that. Um, so I, 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 don't, I don't know, I, like I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I mean, I know I'll keep doing all of what I'm doing and stealing the culture and everything, but I'm really wrestling really deeply about how can I behave virtually and responsibly in this kairos? And I take that question, that question is haunting me because I, I, I'm, I'm, really suspicious. I'm suspicious of any easy answer for the reasons I've given and, and something else. And I know part of it is Part of it is you can train your ear, and that's part of what you're doing, right? You're trying to, can I hear the, the first notes of the new melody? Can I hear the calling? And part of what we're, we're doing is, yeah, but how do I turn that in, from a metaphor into something we do, something we share? This is, this is what, 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 what um, so um, I really want to encourage you with what you're doing, and um, I, 
I think you're putting yourself into trying to catch the wind of a maelstrom. Mm -hmm. And, um, but if you're a good sailor, right? Um, I, there's a, one of my favorite scenes in Moby Dick, the Lee Shore. He talks about this ship and, right? And there's a storm and it's outside of the port. And what the ship wants to easily do is just go into the port. But what it has to do is it has to marshal the wind and use the wind to go out to sea. That's what I think you're launching yourself into. And I think it is admirable and challenging. I hope I can help you. Uh, but um, I, 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 there's, uh, I've come to sort of something analogous that's really reverberating in me. It's like, how do I do what Melville said? How do I virtuously turn right, my sails in the maelstrom so I can sail? He calls it into the open sea of truth. Right, um, and I, I, and uh, part of course what, what people are wrestling with in Moby Dick is there's no easy answer. Um, so I, I, I deeply uh, empathize and admire and I hope I can be of help. I hope you will help me because I hope mm -hmm. you'll help me because all of this is, for me this is, this is, this is for me the, the, the central existential virtue question I think right now. It's the most exigent pressing. Mm -hmm. How can I be virtuous in a genuine kairos? Yeah. Yeah, I want to speak to that because that's, because I framed it as talking about kind of wrapping up rebel wisdom, but obviously that's in order to, to go yeah. to something else. And it's also, there's something in what you're saying about what is, what is my piece to hold? What is your piece to hold? What is your piece to hold? And they're, they're different, like you, yeah. I, I can, and my piece to hold, I think, is, is more going from making things just for YouTube to trying to get more mainstream and legacy media attention on some of these yeah. ideas, some of these practices, going back, completing that kind of hero's journey of going from the legacy out into the alternative and coming back with the gold and supporting people like yourself mm. and, and shining a light on it and saying, this is significant. Hey, everyone, look at this. This is significant. And this is how it fits together with other things. That's the thing that I think that I am able to bring because I've been involved in so many of these different conversations. And I've also got a sense of where the the mainstream conversation is and what the pressure points are on that conversation right. to be able to say, this is how that relates to this and this is why it's significant because of the times we're going through. And that's the story, like, that's the story that I think I'm called to, t to tell. And that now is no longer a rebel thing. It's no longer just an alternative thing. I think yeah. it was an alternative thing and it coalesced as an alternative thing, but now it's, it's time to, to see how many of those pressure points we can kind of, we can press on. And there's, yeah, one of those is the media side. Another of those is, for me, I talked to Jonathan yesterday about going back into the gender conversation. Mm -hmm. It feels very timely to, to go back into their, that in a very sort of mature way. And what does a healthy relationship, what does a healthy conversation between right. the masculine and the feminine look like? Because that's a huge cultural pressure point that, again, because of the, the background and the stuff that I've been doing with Rebel Wisdom is also feels like something I'm positioned to articulate. But your, your, your job is just to recreate the Axial Revolution, John. You, you haven't taken on a, a big plan at all yourself. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I do want the Axial Revolution, not the French Revolution. But I um, love the way you talk when you talk about kind of the, the, the distributing of practices. Like, that has to be what it's about. It's like, how do you create those practices of virtue, those practices of connection that then become an embodied living thing that, that changes things rather than coming up with an idea that's going to change things? Uh, yeah, I think it's that. Um, I think we have to recover the the distributed functionality. So you could you could move up levels of this. We used to have the 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 the, the triad of the university, the monastery, and the and the church, and the university. And they, they always they overlap. But so I'm just talking about emphasis. The university emphasizes knowledge, the monastery wisdom, and then the church emphasizes yeah. But that knowledge and that wisdom that better be transferable to lives or it's worthless, right? And so we, we that functionality, right? I, I don't, I, we, it's absolutely necessary, but I don't know how we reconfigure it today. The university has spun off in its own way, and of course the church has spun off, and then it's, it keeps doing, it both spins and fragments. Paul would be the first to admit that. Protestantism is not slowing the rate at which it fragments, it's still happening. Right, um, and of course, the monastery is largely 
obsolete or irrelevant to most people's lives. And so how we reconfigure that, um, I don't know. Um, and, 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 but yeah, that's what's needed. Um, and I, 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 the reason why I, I need to talk to people like Jonathan is, I mean, I think Jonathan is tuned, has, has really finely tuned his ear to catch that melody, the first notes of it, um, in a way that I, I haven't. And um, that's, that's what I think is a, 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 a really important value right now. Hmm. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I, yeah. I, I definitely, I mean, it's clearly I have, a, I have a different, I mean, my, my approach is, I, is rather, I think that the new world will be given and I, it's hard for people to understand what that means, but I think that the world functions, worlds are built on revelations, like mm -hmm. they just are, and, and, and I hate for that. Like, people, I know people struggle to understand what I'm saying, but you know, that, that's why if you look at, you, if you look at every civilization, it's always ultimately started with like some relationship between a god and a human, like every single civilization. There's always at the outset some demigod that every things have a revelatory they need a revelation in order to to start and in christianity we have a sense in which there will be right that there's an eschatological notion mm -hmm. that there will be a revelation and there's a sense in which you have to live in a moment where we're calling upon that revelation right in the book of revelation you see it's like come lord jesus right that image of the saints that are waiting and anticipate you know waiting with anticipation and calling upon this revelation to happen but there's a manner in which i truly believe that until that happens we have to take what is given and we have to make the most of it mm -hmm. and so that's one of the reasons why i i to me the best thing I can do is to take this the Christian tradition and to be able to do what I can to make it as vibrant as yes. I can and to make it as real as possible. And, uh, and so it can help you understand why, I've, why I've, the, the strategy that I'm, it's not a strategy, but like why I live the way that I do, you could say it that way. Yeah. But, but there's a notion, and, I, and I, 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 I see it in Dionysus and Maximus, so I don't think it's completely foreign to your tradition. And, but it's it's much more pronounced in the Neoplatonic tradition about a cultivated receptivity, mm -hmm. right? A very, I, I like that. And, and you have to hear in this a, a profound kind of <clears throat> virtuosity and virtue, like, and, and this is in the key of uh, a key thing in Taoism, right? Cultivating a kind of profound receptivity. <clears throat> There's a lot of ways in which we're blinded, uh, we're dulled, uh, we're, we're deafened, and that will will prevent us from. I'll use your language for now, for, for, for hearing the revelation or seeing mm -hmm. it. And so I do think there's a lot we, I, and I don't think you're recommending passivity. I, no. I think there's a lot we can do um, about cultivating a deep and profound kind of res, uh, receptivity that will be, will become responsibility, responding, ability mm -hmm. to respond when the, the, the new insight, the new disclosure happens. I do think that is something that can be recommended right now for mm -hmm. people. So I'm sure we could find another loads of more topics yeah. and carry on talking for several more hours, but um, this was a fantastic conversation. Really glad that you took the time to come over from Montreal. Yeah, it was so such a joy. And thanks for facilitating it. Thanks for making it possible. Like John, thanks for, it's been great to have real yeah. Like, mm. th these these people sadly are not embodied with us right now, but we definitely have been have taken all the advantage of actually being in the same space and seeing that dynamism. It's yeah. it's great, it's wonderful. I feel like yeah. the world is kind of coming alive again, you know, after COVID as well. Yeah, and I want to say thank to both of you. Like the thing I was feeling to, to to say is like when when you share about your the work that you're doing, both of you, I feel like this real sense of like congruence and authenticity mm. and like the words matching the actions and sort of, yeah, really living that in the world. So I'm really glad to meet you in person for yeah, the first time properly. To, yeah. And John, always. Well, well thank you, David. It's, this has been wonderful. Um, and um, uh, like the, yeah, what, what Jonathan said, being here, the, 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 the dynamic living spirit of it has been fantastic. Um, and, and again, it's always and it's, it's, it's a joy to talk to, uh, mm. to Jonathan. And, uh, and so 
I do think that I, to use the metaphor, I hear the first notes in these kinds of conversations. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. where I hear them. Uh, in the, when, when dialogue was when the logos really takes over and we're following it rather than just saying what we want to say, um, that's where I start to get the first sort of prairie of notes from the horizon. And so it's always uh, a privilege to do that. And I hope that what we've done will be that for other people. They can start to hear the beginnings of it. Mm.